afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Rivera Wilson, and welcome to Ed Trends: Problem-Based and pro Project-Based Teaching in Person and Remote. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Jason Lane won't be able to be here to greet you, um, but I'm going to be sharing you, with you a, a few things that might be of interest to you. Um, the Remote ED Ed's website was established back in March of this year, and currently we have nearly 1,800 free educational resources available to parents, teachers, and school. We encourage you to use that site um, as you teach remotely, uh, also in your daily teaching face-to-face. Uh, -face. If you would like to learn more about our upcoming offerings on Remote ED or through an uh, Atlas, please follow us on Atlas ED or at USOE at Atlas. Community Conversations uh, has been rebranded to be called Ed Trends. So if you receive future emails in reference to information regarding upcoming events and you see Ed Trends, it's just Community Conversations with a new name. If you're interested in receiving continuing teacher leader education hours, um, please email me, jriverawilson at albany.edu or visit us at atlased.org for more information. We are pleased today to have the New York State Master Teacher Program with us. Uh, this is an ongoing series. If you wish to learn more about the New York State Master Teacher Program, you can visit it at its web website at suny.edu master teacher. Today's panelists um, come from various school districts. They're all New York State Master Teacher Program uh, uh, fellows. And here we have is Janine Flitton from Gatway School District, Lisa Fort from Queensbury School District, Susan Pientas from Saratoga Springs City School District, and Casey Ria from Shawmont Central School District. Welcome ladies and welcome to Ed Trends. Um, I will be serving as your guide. So please let me know when you would like me to move to the next slide. Hey, hi, I'm um, Casey Sambrock or Ria. I go by both. <laughs> um, so um, I taught at um, HFM um, P-TECH, it's an early college high school. And that's where I first learned about project-based learning. Before I taught there, I thought I did project-based learning. It's like, yeah, I do projects. But then I started teaching there and I got fully trained um, by a, um, a coach from uh, who went through the Buck Institute um, training. And I learned really what project-based learning was there. So now I teach um, sixth grade digital literacy and I teach various computer science classes from grades seven through 12. Hello, I'm Susan Pianta, and um, like Casey, I um, worked at HFM BOCES P-TECH. Um, I left a grade school because I just wanted to be like immersed in a, a project-based environment. Um, and so I worked there for two years and yeah, you really get immersed when you're just doing it 24 seven um, interdisciplinary. Um, and now I'm at Saratoga um, and I'm trying to incorporate it as best I can within the confines of a big school and um, aligning your curriculum with all the other teachers. Um, so I'll share a little bit of how that looks for me. Hi, I'm Janine Flinton and um, I teach Project Lead the Way, which is a student-driven collaborative hands-on curriculum to grades K through six at Joseph Henry Elementary School. And uh, about six years ago, I attended a Project Lead the Way training with the intent of bringing it to uh, my fourth grade class that I was teaching them. And after attending the training and seeing all the benefits of this type of instruction, um, I went back and my, I told my administrator about it and um, she was uh, thrilled with it and established Project Lead the Way as a special area class. So now I am a special area teacher um, and so the students go to PE, Art, Music, and Project Lead the Way. So Lisa Fort is here on the call, but um, is not as like in the Zoom to listen. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure what happened, but I'm conveying that message. 
right. Okay, um, so to start off, we'll just talk a little bit about um, problem based learning versus project based learning. Um, and honestly, once I started thinking about it, I was like, I don't really know the difference. I feel like I should have known. Um, but there are some key differences um, between the two. And, you know, if you look at um, an article in Edutopia um, from Buck Institute, they really say pro problem based learning is a subset of project based learning. So there's many, many um, similarities between the two. They both have the open ended questions and tasks. They both um, emphasize student independence and inquiry, um, but there's just a few little minor um, differences between the two. Um, with project-based learning, you go through the process of critical thinking to examine a problem that usually has a well, pretty well-defined answer. And with problem-based learning, um, students are given a problem with preliminary information and you don't always produce a full polished product with that. Um, and so you can see here with this chart that, um, you know, project-based learning, um, like Susan said, is often multidisciplinary, incorporating a lot of different subject areas. Um, and they're often very long-term projects where problem-based learning is um, focusing more on a single subject with short-term projects. Okay, um, why we use project and problem-based learning? Um, both project and problem-based learning, it empowers the student to develop their critical thinking and problem-solving skills. And it's not isolated, it's how it relates to the world around them. Um, I teach Project Lead the Way, and Project Lead the Way uses what's called the Activities, Project, and Problem-Based Learning Approach, or APB, Instructional Approach. Um, there are modules that cover both engineering, computer science, and biomedical. And um, each module is introduced by uh, reading a fictional story and the characters in the story introduce the problem to the students um, so that it presets learning. And they also you pose essential questions to them. The students then collaborate and use the engineering design process to solve that real world problem that has been presented to them. Um, so using problem and project-based learning really helps promote equity. In Project Lead the Way, um, the first thing the students do is they complete three activities. And as we know, students come to the classroom with a varying degree of background knowledge and skills. By having them complete these um, three activities, they really helps them, it kind of levels the playing field um, and really gives them uh, that background knowledge that they'll need to solve that real world problem. So for instance, um, some students may not have ever utilized um, controllers or any kind of a, um, a robotic system. So uh, they would do an activity that kind of introduces a, a, a remote control to them and a sensor, what is a sensor, what is a, um, a bumper switch and things like that. So it, the activities that they complete are well defined and so that the outcomes are similar. So it really strengthens, it can strengthen a math skill or an ELA, ELA skill um, that they might need to solve the real world problem. Um, and no matter whether you're doing the uh, Project Lead the Way curriculum or any project and problem based learning, it's, it's really just good practice to give those students the opportunity to gain that those background knowledge and skills that they'll need um, further along in, in the problem solving. Okay. Um, it also provides opportunities for collaboration. Uh, students are able to um, really work together and learn from each other. And um, they all bring different strengths to the table and they also have um, challenges. So by using collaboration, uh, they can all really um, benefit from working with their peers. And we start this right from an early age, from preschool and, and kindergartners. And sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult for kindergartners to um, collaborate with the, each other at that age because they are, um, they're still in that me stage where I want my idea. So for them, to be able to work out uh, 
which problem they're going to, uh, how they're going to solve their problem and which solution they're going to try. Um, it's just great experience. And it's, it's starting at a young age. It's, it's a life skill being able to collaborate with your peers, especially in this global economy that we uh, that they're going to grow up in. Um, and it also, so project and problem-based learning also addresses varied learning styles. And I think this is the best part about um, doing this type of instruction is that um, it really addresses everyone's needs, whether it be you're a, if you are a visual learner um, or hands-on learner. And often um, it's those students that may not, they may struggle with ELA and math in a conventional classroom setting. But once they get in a hands-on, student-driven um, environment, they really thrive. And you can just see their self-esteem build. Because all of a sudden, those peers that, that may have, um, you know, the high-flying peers, they may um, now be looking to those students that often don't excel and say, well, how did you, how did you fix that? Or how did you build that? And um, so it really promotes self-esteem in, in all learners. So, um, and um, it also helps those students that um, may struggle, those high flyers, because uh, often they aren't risk takers and having them be in this environment where they see other students taking risks and it's okay not to have to have that right answer. So it really also helps their, them as well. Again, collaborative learning and um, problem-based and project-based learning really helps develop life skills. Now, not only collaboration, but also they're working through the uh, solving a problem and just having them be able to look at a problem and develop those computational thinking skills of how do I take a problem and break it down? How do I approach solving the problem? And whether they become engineers or go into some type of uh, that field, regardless, it's, it's a life skill that will help them being able to approach any problem that they may come across. Um, the other thing is, as they work through, we use a lot of the engineering design process in Project Lead the Way. Um, and as they work through the process, there is always that end explanation of their their findings. What, they, what did they discover? And I think that's one of the most important things they learn is that um, even though a solution may not work the first time, it's okay. Um, they see what they, they what they've learned and how can I make it better. So it's really developing that life skill of kind of failing forward, and it's okay if you don't get the um, the right answer right away, but to keep trying, learning that persistence. And again, just how to approach a problem in itself. Um, okay, go ahead. Often with um, project and problem-based learning, um, it's the piece, the assessment piece. Well, teachers sometimes think, well, how am I going to assess this? I still need a grade. Um, I use a, a, an engineering notebook and for both formative and summative assessments. Um, again, I want them, they draw about what they're building or the investigation that we're doing, and then they're explaining it using claims and evidence. Um, they're, they might be gathering data using the scientific inquiry process. And that, so they're gathering the data and then they're writing about it. It's authentic learning. And then they realize, you know, as they're building this content knowledge and these skills, how am I going to use this to solve that real world problem at the end of my design process. So um, I use engineering notebooks and the project itself. Um, so if the two students you see with the little car and the, and the bag, um, can they explain to me, they send that down a ramp and it, it um, collides with a wall and they have to protect their egg passenger. They had to build a vehicle restraint system to protect their egg passenger. Um, but I see if they can explain, use that content vocabulary and explain to me where the energy is transferred to um, and, you know, observing what their, their outcome was and if they can use an explanation 
um, using content vocabulary and, and the content knowledge that they gained. So um, those are two ways to, to, for project evaluation. There's also, uh, Project Lead Way also has um, some summative assessments or check for understandings that are a little more uh, formal uh, evaluations. Um, and in order to look to assess the engineering notebooks um, and the projects, I use a rubric. And I think it's really helpful um, when you're doing project and problem-based learning to use rubrics for assessment because you can kind of um, look at where they are and, and, you know, did they use the content um, vocabulary? Could they explain their observations and their outcome and the data um, thoroughly? And... Um, you know, did they complete the, the engineering design process and, and come to that final um, stage of where they could um, look at what they developed and say, how could I make it even better? So uh, using rubrics is a great way uh, for assessment for um, project and problem-based learning. Okay. Um, so in the classroom, um, Project and problem-based learning is a little bit easier because you have, you know, the materials um, that you need to um, utilize with it. So when we went to remote instruction in the spring, I wanted to keep that hands-on curriculum going while the students were home. And um, I was wondering, uh, the challenge was, how do I equ equitably do it without having them have the supplies? Uh, so what I did is uh, I turned to nature and go ahead. So, so, yeah. So um, students were still posed with those uh, real world problem, well, with problems. Um, and this is a kindergarten class. So I thought every student should have access to nature. So what students did, um, they were learning about structure and function. And they read this story, Yertle the Turtle by Dr. Seuss, where a turtle wants to be able to view um, his kingdom from a tall um, throne. And so he piles the turtles up and um, sits atop top all the turtles, but it collapses. So students were posed with the problem of they had to think about structure and function and design a throne for Yertle the Turtle. Um, using things they could find in nature. And then they had to be able to support Yertle the turtle on top with a heavy load, and that was a, a, a rock that they did. So again, they could continue that critical thinking skill and developing those problem-solving skills even while they were remote. Okay, go ahead. And I'll just go through some other examples um, that I uh, used at home. Um, Mr. McGregor, protecting Mr. McGregor's garden, um, they had to, Peter Rabbit was getting into Mr. McGregor's garden. So again, thinking about structure and function um, and what could they use to build a structure or a fence that could keep Peter um, Rabbit out of the garden. So again, then they went through the design process um, to, to develop their solutions. Okay, go ahead. And Three Billy Goats Gruff, we were talking about properties of matter. What properties um, of matter help things have buoyancy or structure? And so they had to develop an alternate way for the, the goats to get across the river. Um, they couldn't use the bridge where the, the um, troll was under, so they had to develop some other way. And then they had to test it and evaluate it by putting weight on it, um, which was the pennies, or uh, they developed a different bridge that they could go over. Okay, go ahead. Um, first graders learn about observing the sun and uh, properties of light. And so they were challenged. Their task was to come up with a way to um, use the sun to create uh, prints, shadow prints, and um, see how shadows work. Okay. Um, potential energy and kinetic energy students develop zip lines and um, they had to figure out how to get their passenger as far as they could on their zip, zip line using, um, you know, how the height and what the height did to the amount of potential energy their 
passenger had and how much kinetic energy and the distance it would travel. Next. Um, fourth graders were studying about waves, so they had to develop, their challenge was to develop um, a wave that would um, show the transfer of energy and um, they also investigated amplitude, amplitude and wavelength. Next. And this, this one um, was uh, students were um, posed with the problem of developing um, something, a solar oven. So we talked about energy conversion and thermal conductivity, um, and they uh, developed their own solar uh, ovens and made s'mores outside. So again, getting them off those devices while they were remote and get them out into um, nature and still learning um, and creating a project um, to, to kind of be the vehicle for their learning. Okay. Um, again, uh, potential and kinetic energy. Uh, students had paper at home, so um, uh, they were posed with the problem of creating a roller coaster and then, you know, if they could get a loop to work with their roller coaster and they made that out of paper and just needed a marble or a small ball um, to, to investigate that. And next. And then finally, um, sixth graders, um, we were learning about reducing human impact. So um, things that students would have at home would be a box, a small box. So the, um, the real world problem they had to solve was to take a, a shipping container and uh, recycle it and transform it into a uh, shipping container, uh, container home. So again, we learned it. We, it was kind of multifaceted. We learned about math. We learned how to do proportions. We learned it incorporated a lot of measuring, um, changing scale, and uh, they developed their floor plans and they actually built their model of their shipping container house. So that was just some examples of ways that um, we continued project and problem-based learning um, while students were remote. Again, the challenge was um, with trying to have them have the materials at home. I'm going to turn it over to Casey for uh, sixth grade digital lear literacy. Okay, so um, with sixth grade, um, basically it's a completely in project based learning class. Um, I basically took the model that I learned from working at HFM BOCES and then brought it um, over to Shama. So um, basically, I'm going to walk you through the, the different steps. I, I followed the Buck Institute model for this class, which is very specific. Um, I guess some people would think like a more rigid structure because there are specific things you need to do. Um, but I really like it because you teach the students the different parts of the project in the beginning of the year and then they know what to expect. So they're usually coming in um, not having that experience. And just like Janine said, you know, not knowing, you know, it's okay if you don't get it right the first time. And that's part of the learning process and what we want to happen really. Um, so I'm going to go through all of these um, the bulleted points are all the different steps and um, that image there was just um, it was shown to me it's from the new tech network and it made me like understand you know the difference between a project you know on the top there you know you you do those things in sequential order but a lot of different things are happening at once and rotating around and you have some benchmarks and reflections along the way Okay, so the first thing is um, before I start a project, I have um, the students working groups. That is very essential. Um, so they have a group contract. And um, just like Janine said, you know, with some of her kindergartners, um, sixth graders, um, we really need to learn a lot about communication and how to talk to people and tell people when we're having a problem in a polite and nice way. So um, a big part of that is developing the group contract um, and also for students to evaluate their own strengths and weaknesses and, you know, talking about in school and outside of school, bringing in their outside knowledge into the classroom as well when they're filling those out. Um, also, um, behavior, you know, developing what types of behaviors are considered out of bounds behaviors and what are the consequences beyond like yelling um, or kicking them out of the group, but what other solutions can we have? Because really the goal is that we want the whole group to be successful. So if one person is failing, we're all failing. So how can we encourage them to be a productive member of the, the group? And we talk about many times the reason why a student is not on task or you know is off in la-la land is they're confused and they're afraid to ask. So developing strategies um, and ways to get students involved back in the group and active again. 
um, I'll talk more about group roles right later. Um, so then we start the project with the entry document. So there's always an entry document and they're all different kinds of things, letters, websites, podcasts, videos I've made. Um, we even do a court summons for copyright court. Um, one time we hosted like a big event as the entry document. So there are sometimes simple and sometimes um, big elaborate things, but this one's for the programming project with um, our digital footprint. Um, so it's um, congratulating them on getting hired and um, giving them their first job um, as um, employees at Sabre Cyber Coding Labs. Okay, so um, after we do that, I might have had these out of order, um, but basically we develop um, no need to knows and next steps. Um, so we examine the entry doc and we fill out a chart from um, what we learned from the document itself. Um, our current knowledge, so from the entry doc, we can see you know, what the theme of that project is. So that entry doc you saw was um, about programming and digital footprint. So any knowledge, my dad's um, a computer programmer, so he showed me some things, or you know, I have some sort of outside experience. Um, and then um, next steps and questions that they have. So students develop the questions and you can see in this picture on the whiteboard, I have whiteboards all around my room. Um, on the whiteboard, I have the students put up their need to knows, which are their questions. And basically this is a way where I, when I'm teaching, I'm going to their writing on the board and I'm saying, well, you know what? you ask this question, so I'm gonna give you the information that you want. So kind of flipping it around, like they're asking the question, so I'm, um, going to help them and give them the answers that they need. But at the same time, the entry docs is uh, constructed in such a way where um, they're asking the questions I want them to ask. So um, instead of me telling them what they're going to learn today, they're asking me a question and I'm answering it for them. And then we develop a problem statement, which is on top of the board there. Um, that was one where we created mobile apps to help um, fourth graders in our district. Okay, so there's a no need to know. So we fill that out first. And then um, from this chart, we develop that problem statement. And that problem statement stays up on the board because it drives the entire project because they do get involved and the kids get really into what they're doing. So we always have to know we're doing this for a purpose. We're doing this to, to serve some sort of problem and to create a solution. Next slide. Okay, so then all along the way, there are benchmarks. Um, so some informal assessments, um, check-ins, things like that. Um, so those could be um, right here, we have a plan for their, their app. So we do talk about the engineering design process at the beginning of the year. Um, we do another project that's um, uh, environmental design. Um, so they learn about making a plan and having prototypes and questioning what those prototypes and how they'll work, and then going back and revising before they um, create it. So they do have check-ins with me along the way for benchmarks. Um, and then I try my best um, to get guest speakers and experts to come in and assist um, to get that community involvement in and to get the students feeling like, you know, they're really a part of this. Um, this is a real thing. Um, so we've had um, code.org's great. I found volunteers and programmers um, from there. The DEC, um, members of the DEC have come in to speak. So it's um, another element that really makes the project real for the students. Um, and then culminating projects, um, there are a variety. So at the end, there's always some sort of big final project at the end. So they could make, um, it's their actual app. Um, it could be a, a, a program, an animation, a little story in Scratch or a music video. We do mock trials. We've done Google map tours, um, all sorts of different projects. But at the end of the project, there is that culminating product and event. Okay, so um, when I started doing this, it's like chaotic um, because everyone works at a different pace and, and that's encouraged with project-based learning. But when you have um, eight groups of sixth graders all working at different points and you're trying to keep track and you've got all these different classes running, um, it's hard to you know, 
keep track of everything. So, um, and to keep make sure the students know what they're doing because they're all at different spots. Um, so I use a, a self-pacing checklist where um, I teach the students how to develop their goals. Um, so they'll each have a quick meeting in the beginning of class and they have a couple um, things that they need to do, um, mostly involving communicating with one another and then make their work goal for today. So then I can go around the room and make sure the students are actually meeting their work goals and being productive for the day. Um, and then this year, now I teach, I used to teach, um, I developed the entire um, digital literacy curriculum for my school um, that was project-based learning um, based. Um, and now I'm kind of expanding into computer science. So this year I was given um, a new class, Innovations in Computer Science. Um, and this one doesn't follow the book model because it is brand new and I'm just starting to develop it. So I just wasn't ready. So I, I wanted to put this in there because it is okay, you know, if, if you're um, beginning or, you know, you're just trying to dabble. Um, this very well-defined plan that I had was developed over years. Um, but I went to a workshop um, with Sherry Sinclair um, from Coaching Redefined, and she talked about different levels of projects. Like they don't all need to be full out, like well-defined like mine are. So this class definitely is project-based, but it just doesn't have all those um, Buck Institute elements yet. So the students are given a question, are artificial intelligence and automation beneficial or detriment to human society? And so throughout this whole unit, they are working on trying to um, adjust their claim and their their stance on this position. And I also have to give credit to Dr. Margaret, Margaret Sheehy um, because this was also inspired from her knowledge building unit. Next slide, please. Um, and so what they do is um, throughout the course, this is only a 10 week course. So we engage in a bunch of different activities. Um, we covert um, this year, so we're, um, my eighth grade students are hybrid. My sixth grade are in person every day, so I see them every day. Um, but for my hybrid students, we code virtual robots, so um, there's no issues there. So I had to make some adjust adjustments, um, read articles, watch videos, um, and we explore programs that use machine learning, um, all while adjusting their claim based on the evidence they're experiencing in class um, in their journals. So they do keep a journal much like in Janine's class um, throughout the entire course. And then in the final products, they write a final claim essay um, and engage in a Socratic seminar and they code their own machine learning products. Okay, um, hopefully this is working. Um, I apologize for not being in to introduce myself earlier. So I'm Lisa Ford. I teach um, high school earth science at Queensbury. And um, over the course of the last few years, I've developed more instruction that is um, incorporating project-based activities or problem-based activities into the grander scheme of my content. So it's not something that um, the students are necessarily doing at every step or every day. Um, the first time that I did this, um, I did use more of the Buck Institute that Casey was just talking about with the standard model. D-man. <laughs> Sorry. My young son is playing with his car, so that's what you might be able to hear in the background. I apologize. Um, so um, the standard model of showing a sample phenomenon, a letter, um, getting the students engaged. And the first time I tried this, I actually did it um, in conjunction where the students were um, learning content for the first half of the class, and then they had work time for the second half of the class on their projects. Um, and that actually worked fairly efficiently as long as I followed actually a lot of the things that um, you just heard from Casey, which are excellent, um, making sure that they have a contract, that they're setting their goals for the day, that they know what the expectations are, and that um, they have really firm scaffolds in place to learn each of the pieces that they need along the way. Um, what I did find doing it that way was that students struggled to kind of get the, the general content um, and also work on their projects. It was like changing their brain from one side to the other um, was a little bit of a difficulty for them, especially since 
for um, many of my students, even at the high school, it was the first time that they were ever having the opportunity to really delve into um, a, a, a question and really take it their own way or their own direction. Um, I was really fortunate the first time that I did this with the standard um, model, I um, happened to do it for a UNESCO project where they had to um, create a an area around the world that they wanted to protect um, as part of earth science in our um, landscapes unit piece. And it just happened to be the same year that the Azure window fell apart. So we were able to use that as our sort of um, introductory piece to really say, this is why we need to sort of protect some of our geologic features around the world. So it was just really good timing. Um, and I will say that I know that the project was meaningful to the students because it's a 10th grade class and even in 11th and 12th grade, I still had those students coming back, um, you know, bringing that project back up and talking about how um, they um, enjoyed it. They wanted to know if the students in the next years were doing it um, and we still incorporate it or I still incorporate it. I just changed it a little bit um, and modified. And so, um, one of the things that um, after doing that and then having the students present and we had special guests come in for their presentations at the end and sort of judge who was the winner. Um, and uh, we did the same for a climate based one that I did the students actually presented um, much like a science fair at the senior research presentation night and um, the visitors were able to kind of fill out a little quick survey at the end of whose presentation they enjoyed. Um, also what ideas that were presented that they enjoyed. So there's sort of like different categories of um, success, if you will, um, but that didn't necessarily play into their overall scores. Um, for myself, I use rubrics as well. And I present those at the beginning for students. Um, and my rubrics aren't on the four scale. I use um, a three column rubric where the center is the expectations and then they can um, meet those expectations or they can exceed them or they can um, fail to meet them, so to speak. And um, the students are able to sort of evaluate themselves along the way. Are they meeting, are they exceeding? Um, they can also um, write in where they believe they've exceeded. And um, students really enjoy that uh, aspect, being able to say, I think I exceeded the expectation by doing this piece uh, or this component. Um, after doing the standard model, I started to reevaluate um, how it was being delivered to the students because of that issue of um, trying to deliver content at the same time as doing a, a problem or a project with them. And so um, I termed it the adaptive model um, and implementing it a little differently. So now what I tend to do is still have an, an event that brings them in, whether that is um, a letter or a video or something that just attracts them into it. And um, so one of the ones that I did last year that was really successful was the Red Planet piece. and. Um, the quest to actually go to Mars. And so we started off by doing the labs and the investigation that the students had said, you know, this is what we need to know to be able to do that. Um, so we looked at space flight and spaceships and communication and spacesuits and everything. And then they were able to, after doing those introductory, do more of like the genius hour deeper research where they could take one topic and say, I really want to explore this. I'm really curious about doing this a little bit more. And um, I do choice board presentations. So I have on my wall, I have, you can present in all of these different formats. Um, and, but they have to be shown to the community of learners. And so they can stand up in front of the class and do a presentation. They can make a video that we're going to play. Um, they can um, create a newspaper article or whatever that um, we're going to read as a class so everybody can see that. Um, and along the way, we do um, gallery walks and reflections so that they can get ideas from their classmates to really improve um, on their learning because often if they're doing 
um, space flight and someone else might be doing um, housing on Mars, they still have ideas that they can ask their classmates, like, did you think about this or do you think about that? So um, if we move on to the next slide, we'll see some of that um, piece. So I just present, here's the red planet. Um, last year they asked if we could watch the Martian. So we only actually watched the first like half an hour maybe of the Martian just to get thinking about it. And then the, these images here show one of my groups um, doing the labs on communication. So what they were doing is you can see that there's a group of young men in the foreground and they have the explanation, they're the earth module and they have the explanation on how to build the um, stuff. And in the background in the other room is their Mars bound um, colleagues who have all the material that they have to then build um, in this case, a rover. Um, and uh, last year they were doing this via the Google Meet to try and explain. They couldn't show the pictures. So you can see um, in the center picture at the top, they have the instructions on how to build it, but they have to try and explain how to build it. Thankfully, the young men in at Mars station discovered that if they keep holding their um, module up, they can get a yes, no from Earth. Um, we did talk about the delay of communication and that they had the benefit of it was immediate feedback, whereas um, to Mars, there would be a delay in feedback. Um, but they had fun recognizing that trying to talk to and communicate with somebody at a distance that can't see all of this stuff um, is definitely a problem. And so these this young group actually did um, want to investigate more how to improve communication between Earth and Mars. So their project continued on there. Um, and if we continue, I'll show you some other activities. So again, um, one back. The, <laughs> it doesn't want to go there. Um, so we did um, space flight. The students um, were able to build rockets. You can see we're very fortunate at Queensbury. We got a new build and our um, foyer of the school is, um, it has a really high ceiling. So we did stomp rockets. They built their rockets um, and we tested, flew them. And then we brought material down with us and the students asked if they could make modifications on the spot. And so we gave them five minutes to make modifications to their rockets and then we test flew them again. And um, so that was also a really good learning experience because they were able to kind of on the spot go, okay, this didn't work. This is what I need to make um, and then take that back. And some of the groups um, then worked on space flight and thinking about modifications that they might need to make and looking at space flights that have already happened. Um, you also see there's a, the groups are um, going and they're doing some work on um, looking at other um, projects and things that are going on to give suggestions and feedback to their colleagues. And then the last piece I have um, on the next slide is just talking about, you know, how does this look this year in the hybrid, because we're doing hybrid at the high school. And so a lot of times what we I have students doing now is we use things like Padlet instead of um, doing a gallery walk. So students put their ideas up in the columns on Padlet and then um, their colleagues can go in and read and make some comments and hopefully help them along with their projects. And the other thing that we do a lot of is they have individual breakout rooms where they can meet with their colleagues and share data and planning and try and create and keep it equitable because we also have some full remote um, learners that we want to make sure are a part of the experience even if they don't have the opportunity to be totally hands-on um, with us at that time. So these tend to be now more um, incorporated where we do um, the learning of the labs and then the students can then step out and say, which piece do I want to investigate more, complete that, um, and then present to um, their colleagues in a final um, piece. So we still will have the presentations. Um, the presentations are actually just to come. And the plan is to have them um, presenting with the um, student who's at home 
on our, our screen, our remote learner being able to um, be part of that presentation and sort of do a dual presentation, one live, one at home. And then next time, hopefully it'll be flipped so that um, it's not always the same person in the room having to speak in front of their classmates. Oh, and um, I think if you go to the next slide, I think it's on to Susan. There you go. Hello again, I'm Susan Panta. Um, I teach living environment to ninth and 10th graders um, at Saratoga Springs High School. Um, and so it's, it can definitely be overwhelming trying to think about fitting your region's curriculum. So if you are a, a teacher of a class that teaches to the regions, um, you know, making sure you're covering all the content um, can be intimidating doing it in a project based. Um, so, and I've definitely had to scale down um, again because we are aligning with, so I need to be covering the same things um, as, the same, as the other teachers at the same time. Um, so I've, it's led me to kind of think about, okay, what are these like big overarching um, questions that can like drive a unit and also, um, allow for some project-based learning. Um, so one thing I would say is if you have an idea is to reach out to local um, companies or businesses, they love getting involved. Um, so I was just actually asking um, Toga Nola, it's a company in Saratoga that makes granola and um, granola bars. And I just wanted to use their name and like for their entry doc to just say like, you're looking, they're looking for um, cricket bars and they wanna know the benefits and all of this. And they were so excited. They're like, actually, can we make them? And then we can sell them. And um, so they jumped on board and they came in and they helped launch the project. And then they were also the audience. Um, so again, something that really helps with project-based learning um, and getting that buy-in from kids is an authentic audience for the um, culminating project. Um, so if it's actually somebody in the field or somebody who's reading or somebody they're presenting to, it raises the stakes and they take it that much more seriously. Um, so the students knew that um, they were going to be judged by them and then the um, winning granola bar and recipe and marketing um, would actually be chosen and featured at the farmer's market um, by Toganola. Um, so and so this was a project and it, you know, I'm biology. So we talked about, you know, how your body breaks things down and um, all of that was incorporated in this project. Um, when we went to, can you go back one, sorry. Um, remote learning, um, again, these kind of questions, should we alter human genes? Um, and so I tied in the reproductive unit um, with biotechnology um, and, um, I don't know your experiences in the spring with engagement, um, you know, hit or miss for some kids, but this actually kids really had strong opinions about this. Um, so we started with this, you know, question and their initial ideas and what else they needed to know. Um, and, you know, they wanted to know more because they didn't really know how it worked, but they had strong feelings about whether we should do it or not. Um, so that was one way that I attempted to do it during remote learning. Um, and now in hybrid, um, if we go to the next slide, um, we're looking right now as should wolves be reintroduced to New York. Um, again, reached out to DEC and use a real wildlife biologist um, on the letter for students and their entry doc. Um, as Casey talked about, um, we started with all these questions like, what do we need to know? And this Padlet board has been driving our unit. Like we go back to these questions um, and think, okay, what do we need to know? What haven't we figured out? Can we answer these questions yet? Um, and we keep coming back and that's also driving my instruction, um, but then driving what they need to know um, for this project. Next slide. Um, and again, um, anytime you can get the kids you know, doing the work of the scientists or the professionals in the field um, or analyzing um, what they're doing and, and giving them that experience to see these, you know, other jobs. Um, Janine talked about collaboration. Like there's a lot of things in my regions class that I actually honestly don't care if they know in 10 years. Like there's a lot of stuff that I don't actually think impacts 
their life or their ability to be a functioning human. But um, what project-based learning does, it does give them those skills of collaborating and exploring new ideas and problem solving, which I think is, is more important for our students. Um, and getting them outside, especially now, um, we did track plates. So I've, in the past, I've had permits so we can do small mammal trapping and they can look at the number of mammals and make an estimate um, of how many mammals are in the area and um, how many wolves those mammals will be able to support using um, their food pyramids and their food webs. Um, this year I didn't have a permit, um, but uh, was desperate to get kids outside and we did track plates. Um, so you cover these plates with graphite powder. And so we look to see the diversity and what mammals we have in our community. And if you have the ability to get kids outside, it was amazing the difference um, that it made in terms of kids engagement. Um, they are stuck in front of screens all the time. Um, so I loved um, hearing about what Janine's doing with found materials. Um, anything we can do to get our kids away from the screens, I think is going to be really helpful um, as this year um, continues. And so again, kids are explored, like kids who are like, wait, there's a job for people and they go and they collect mammals. There's a job that people do this. Um, so another great thing about project-based learning is it's, it's exposing kids to um, actual careers that are not your typical um, careers that people normally see. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, here's some online resources. Um, down here at the bottom is newvisions.org. Um, something to note if you're a science teacher is that um, NGSS and phenomenon-based units are very problem-based oriented. Um, so you have this question or this problem and some of it's lesson by lesson, um, but you can also have these bigger overarching questions that can drive a unit um, and lead to problem-based. And again, like people are saying, you can start small um, and, you know, some of it you're like, I, I'm still like teaching more than I want to than the kids yourself. But again, that's your first time doing it. it you're realizing how much more freedom you can give to your students um, and you're learning too. Um, so um, as like, if you're, when you're a novice PBL instructor, it's gonna look different than, you know, Casey who's been doing it for years and has this all organized. Um, but I think it's important to be like, yeah, when you start, like when you're starting a new class, you might just do like one project and you're like, okay, we're getting used to it. I'm getting used to it. Um, so see resources, ask people. Um, and yeah, there's lots of resources out there to get you started if that's something you're interested in. Um, and the next is just questions and feel free to jot down our contact information if you have any follow-up questions about um, anything um, we've talked about. So I was wondering if there are the uh, attendees today have any questions in reference to today's presentation. I must say before we even address any questions that session was absolutely fabulous. I think that um, many people will continue to rewatch just because it was so full of information. And I do appreciate the resources and we will make those resources available on the remote ED website as well. So I was wondering, if, does anyone have any questions for the panelists today? You were so thorough, there are no questions. Um, again, many thanks for a wonderful presentation. This, pre this um, presentation will be available on the Ed Trends website uh, within a week. Um, and we will also be sharing it, um, you know, we'll be doing reruns of this presentation in the near future. So um, please visit remoteed.org um, for the resources as well as this presentation to share with your colleagues um, or uh, parents who wish to do project-based learning um, at, and problem-based learning at home. Again, many thanks to the presenters for a wonderful presentation. I wish everyone a wonderful evening. And until next time, have a lovely evening and stay healthy and happy and have a wonderful holiday next week. Thank you. Thank you.